Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. And welcome to part two of the Castro Mitchell uh, episodes. We'll, we'll call it that. I'm excited to be able to have uh, Josh in studio as well. Uh, the previous episode um, was uh, his husband, Richard, which we kind of teased at the end of the episode. So if you missed that one, we invite you to uh, pick up Richard's episode and kind of uh, begin part one of this three-part series. So excited to have you, the listener uh, and watcher, involved in another Latter Day Stories episode. We thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And thank you uh, if you are watching on a video version of the episode. As always, we invite you to participate in the comment section to be able to interact with other guests and, and interact specifically with this episode. And if you are listening on an audio version of the podcast, we invite you to subscribe to this channel wherever you are listening if you haven't already. And uh, super important for us and for the reach of the Latter Day Stories podcast is by having uh, you leave us a rating. I know it doesn't sound like it is a monumental uh, feat, uh, but it does uh, so much good by uh, having listeners give us a rating and a review of this episode and others because it does help us expand our reach as a podcast and it helps us to build bigger and stronger bridges between those who are confused and uh, not understanding of this community and uh, to many of us who are trying to share a candid and vulnerable part of our stories uh, in an effort to help people better understand. So if you'll do that for us, we would appreciate it a lot. So again, thank you. I want to welcome uh, to the podcast episode, um, Joshua Castro Mitchell. Thank you. We're going to call you Josh. Yes. I asked yes. that. Specifically, do you want Josh or Joshua? And both suit you fine. Yes, they do. I'm excited for this interview. I'm super excited because we are going to talk about a, a number of topics. Um, the fact that you uh, are raised uh, or you moved to Utah, uh, raised in the Philippines, um, clearly identify somewhere along the LGBTQ spectrum because you're in the hot seat and, and you're sharing your story. We're, uh, we have an opportunity to really jump into um, just topics of culture, uh, topics of uh, ethnic differences between traditional Latter-day Saints, uh, religious differences between uh, your original um, life in the Philippines as a Roman Catholic and then your conversion to Mormonism uh, a little later in your life, your uh, eventual coming out, then your, uh, your life kind of takes you through because of circumstances within your family to Utah, and not just Utah, Utah, a specific area of Utah that we want to talk about, which is uh, key to this part of your story, but also um, dating, um, marriage, and and not only a same-sex relationship, but an intergenerational relationship, which is something that we haven't really had an opportunity to talk much about on the Latter Gay Stories podcast. So you say, my story is just vanilla. There's not much here. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to have this interview because there's so much about your story that I think our Latter Gay Stories audience will connect with. So... With all that aside, Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, what, uh, where do we start? I, I would love the audience to just to get to know you um, at a really high level, um, a 30,000 foot level. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, what are your passions? What are, what are your excitements? Who is Josh? Yeah, so I'm 27 years old. I'm currently a staff accountant at a software company in Utah. Um, I live in the Phoenix area, so I work completely remote. Um, my passions, um, I very much like drawing. I'm very much into the arts. Um, a lot of my pieces from high school, or some, one of my pieces from high school actually got, um, included in a Springfield art show in Utah. Um, I love math. Um, I also love video games. Uh, yeah. And I also love travel. Uh, we're going to talk about travel too. So I'm, I was just thinking like, <laughs> oh, yeah, we, yes, we do. Uh, and this is going to be part of your great story. I, I want to take us back um, and take the audience through um, the beginning of your story, which really starts in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. um, tell, us what, tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, the culture, and what family life was like 
uh, in, a, in an area that for many of the Latter-day Stories listeners is foreign and unfamiliar. Yeah, so I, I grew up in a city called Baguio in the Philippines. It's kind of in the mountainous area. Um, but we live in a very small house. Um, it's probably a, the size of this room. Um, and I, I have two older sisters and we sleep in a bed together with, with including my mom. Um, unfortunately, uh, my dad passed when I was six um, from an accident. So my mom had to raise us um, just by herself. Um, and um, it, yeah, it, it was very hard for my mom being a single mom, having to deal with three kids. Um, but we, we live a very simple, humbled life. What did she, uh, what did she do for an occupation or to support the family? Um, um, my mom did everything that she could for our family, uh, whether it's selling, selling food at our, my school or just trying to, um, you know, she would just make like pastillas, like little candies and try to sell that uh, on the streets. Um, and then she started selling um, cater catered lunch. Um, but um, yeah. Did you recognize, and thank you, that's vulnerable and difficult. Did you recognize the situation? Being so young, you were six years old. Um, did you recognize how difficult the situation really was? Um, and, and were you and your siblings, your sisters, also actively involved in helping support the family? Um, so I was six when my dad died. So I, like I was very young then and I, I didn't really have any concept. Like when at, at my dad's funeral, um, I, was, I wasn't very emotional. Um, I just, you know, everyone was there and was crying, but I was the only one who was just very, just innocent. Um, but then yeah, growing up, the way that we help our, my mom is we return to her by just being good kids and, um, doing great in school. Um, I was always a a great academic um, student. I've been in several math competitions in the Philippines um, and won a lot of them. So that's kind of how I wanted to help my mom is um, just kind of help take the stress off from her and um, just yeah, be a good kid. You said that uh, you were raised uh, Roman Catholic. For a lot of Latter-day Saints, um, we don't know what that looks like. Uh, so kind of describe to us what church uh, and how religion uh, impacted your family. Yeah, so I would say being Catholic, uh, there's not a lot of personal uh, relationship I get to um, develop with other people because, you know, we go to a massive church and there's just, you know, it's random strangers that you have there and you're there to listen to the same prayers, the same songs every time. And, you know, like they're very outdated prayers. Um, so it's not very personal. Um, so to me, I didn't get really get much a lot from a Catholic church. Um, you know, it's just something that we do every week, every Sunday, go to mass, um, take our communion and then go home. Um, I've often kind of tongue-in-cheek talked about Mormonism and some Latter-day Saints uh, as a pray, pay, and obey member. Uh, in Catholicism, it isn't so much the pay, but it's often just the, or sometimes not even the obey. Uh, there's the, a lot of pray, but um, in terms of, of overall um, indoctrination, did you see that in your, your, in your home at all? I mean, was there a, a strict set of rules, um, an orthodoxy that you were expected to live as a, as a Catholic? Or did, did your mom 
want to see that in the home? Um, my mom def just want us to live a good life. It wasn't, um, there were rules, but it's mostly just to help guide us, be good kids, not necessarily, you know, um, like don't drink tea, don't drink coffee and stuff like that. It's just, um, m yeah, my mom was just very strict with um, scholar, with our academics. That's um, pretty much it. I'm curious, uh, and I ask this question to a lot of the guests, um, especially because we're, we're a podcast that talks about sexuality and gender orientation. At what point do you realize, Josh, I'm different. I'm not like all the other kids. It's it's always been there. I don't think I've there's so one time where I, you know, like oh I'm gay. Um, growing up with a, a, in a female household, and also I grew up with two of my um, very close female cousins. So I was playing with Barbies growing up. Um, I don't, th I don't ever remember playing with cars or anything. And, um, I, I know, I remember going out of the shower and, um, wrapping the towel around me like it is, it's a, it's a dress. I remember wrapping the towel around my hair and making it look like it's my hair, my long hair. Um, and in the Philippines, it's very big on beauty pageants so uh we did a lot i you know i aspired a lot to those um f female models and you know i would take my mom's heels i would wear them i would take our blanket and just wrap it and wear it like a gown and introduce myself in a beauty pageant way did you see um I'm, I'm completely under, uh, unfamiliar with the Philippine culture around sexuality and uh, uh, gender topics and discussions and gender identity. Kind of fill us in. Tell, tell us what it's like um, to be gay or the culture behind sexuality in the Philippines. Yeah, so I would say with my, with my family, I was able to be myself. Um, and my mom never really stopped me from just acting out how I wanted to be. Um, I was a little bit more careful with my um, immediate family, like my grandpa, my uncles. Um, they kind of have like a police or a military background, so I wanted to be a little bit more careful. Um, but in school, grade school, I was very out and proud um you know i would be singing and dancing in school and you know my best friend she's um she would always say um how i'm so girly girly how some flirty flirty um even more than her um so i think i was able to be that and mm, um, my aunts especially, they just kind of allowed me to be that way. Even though I know in the Philippines that same-sex marriage is, I don't think it's still legal in the Philippines. Um, but yeah, I was able to just kind of be myself. I, I think I want to explore that a little bit. I want to explore the uh, cultural aspect of, of sexuality. Um, if being able to have a gay marriage, a same-sex relationship in the Philippines is so frowned upon, I'm, I'm curious uh, how religion views that. Predominantly, the religion is Catholicism um, in the Philippines and in, in much of those, uh, the, 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 those Asian countries in that area. So what was taught religious-wise, if anything, do you remember in Catholicism regarding this topic? And then politically, gov in the government, uh, what did you see on, on Main Street in the actual areas that you lived in regarding these topics? Yeah, so it, I, I moved here in, um, when I was 15, so my, my knowledge um, with culture and, and 
politics is very limited, but um, I know, um, like I, I, there was no real discussion about same-sex marriage in our family or in our religion. Um, I feel like um, it's because to me, when I was growing up, like the word "gay" is really re re refers more to someone's femininity. Um, when someone calls you "bakla," which is gay in the Philippines, it it it's more about them um, acting in a feminine way. Um, but yeah, I have n not much knowledge about same-sex um, relationships now in the Philippines. Um, I know, I think, um, like civil unions are allowed there, um, but I don't think it has progressed. The interesting part of your story is that it intersects with Mormonism. So we have, uh, we have you growing up um, as a youth in the Philippines. Uh, originally as a Roman Catholic, but at some point, Mormonism uh, shows up yes. and knocks at the door. Not literally, but kind of. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, uh, about how you converted to the church and the kind of the experiences around you joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah, so my, my aunt, um, she lives in San Diego and she loves to visit the Philippines. Um, our, our, most of our family is there. So whenever she would come there, she would go to the L to the local LDS church there, and we were always just curious um, on what her church looks uh, looks like. So we decided to come with her at one time, and um, from then it started. You know, they got our names. Um, the missionaries came to our house, and we just started learning about the gospel, and we liked it. Um, I think for me, um, what I, being a 12 year old kid um, who hasn't had a father, um, what really stuck out to me is their message of, you know, families are together forever. And I wanted that um, to be able to be able to see my dad again. And you know the promise that oh you can, um, you, he can be baptized in the spirit world, and you know you can be sealed together in the temple. That stuck out to me. You were twelve when you were baptized. Yes. Did your whole family join the church? Yes, um, it was our decision, and we we liked it. We enjoyed it. Um, what really. Um, was very helpful to us is it provided us, um, I would say, a little bit more order um, and a little bit more guidance in our family, be, um, so that you know we, you know, we have like this straight and narrow path, and that helps my mom because um, it's hard to raise uh, three kids just by yourself. So I think with the church's teachings and guidance, um, that was something that. Um, we liked about it. Yeah, and it sounds like it was probably a, a very beneficial and yes, and uh, uplifting experience for your family. If nothing else, uh, the church I think uh, was probably, as you talked about, I think which is super important. It provided father figures in yes. your life. It provided structure in yes. your life, but it also uh, likely provided some type of financial and supportive situations for your mother. Yes, it did. Because with the church, and I, this is a culture we don't uh, often talk about, but I actually think that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints des deserves um, some credit in its ability to support people who are struggling. And so not only just uh, temporal and spiritual experiences, but uh, in, in a very real way, some monetary um, opportunities with food and with housing and, and the, the ability to help families who are uh, desperate and in need. Uh, there's always criticism on the extent to which the church can use its vast resources to continue to help. But from what I hear in your story, that was an opportunity that your family specifically could benefit from. Yes, it was very beneficial. And um, we also, um, 
we like to fellowship with other members of the church too. Um, like church in the Philippines is very different. It's it's fun. It's not as strict, um, and I would say it really comes down to the Filipino culture of family. Because when you go to church in the Philippines, it feels like family. Um, like I, I love going to church in the Philippines, and um, you know, after after our church service, we would have potluck after, like every family would bring food and we would have we would eat together um so that's something that i really liked about it it's just um it's more of a family there and that's a great segue uh because the church is so focused forward focused and hyper focused on the creation of a nuclear family a family that looks uh, and acts and performs a certain way and in your situation your family wasn't very nuclear it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a tra traditional Mormon family because you have a single mom who is raising three children on her own. And for all that Mormonism teaches, that isn't the proper Mormon family. So how does your, how does your family evolve now that they're in the church um, with this new, not only a new culture and an, uh, a new life as a religious family, but does your mom begin dating? Is there pressure there for your mom to take a Mormon husband? Yeah, um, there is. But I would say um, before that, you know, there's the, you know, the promise of, you know, having your, um, baptizing your dad in, in the temple. Um, and I was very looking forward to that. Um, and... But I always struggled because um, I know being gay, um, I feel like I'm not as worthy sometimes um, to be able to do that. So when we got to the temple, um, I don't know what happens, but I thought what, I was going to be the one to be the one to uh, be baptized for my dad. Um, but it was another uh, young man who was baptized. So... Um, there, then even then I felt like I wasn't really worthy um, because of my sexuality. Um, but then after that, um, you know, with my mom, she, she was introduced to do an LDS um, dating website. And that is how she met my stepdad there. So something like a... LDS singles, uh, some some website uh, for the listeners who may be unfamiliar. You have eHarmony, you have Plenty of Fish, you have these Christian Mingle uh, websites that are specific to uh, Christians who are out there trying to find other Christians um, to date. And not surprising, there are Mormon websites to help Latter-day Saints date. Yes. Um, probably the most popular, not not sponsoring this episode, are like <laughs> LDS singles, but then also for youth, uh, one called Mutual, uh, which are two predominantly Latter-day Saint-based uh, dating apps um, or dating uh, websites that help people um, who have similar backgrounds and interests get to know each other. So your mom, she meets uh, or begins dating yes. someone from the United States? Yes. Um, so... Uh there, there was a couple of guys that she was dating, um, but uh, it was really it was my stepdad, um, Jesse, who was um, the one that she really fell in love with. And, you know, we were still in the Philippines, so we were video chatting with him. And um, we were just always excited um, to, to meet him and to, you know, to me to, to also have a father. Um, that's also very important to me. How old were you uh, when your mom started dating Jesse? Probably when I was 13, 14. And what were originally or early on as she was dating, I'm just, I'm just trying to kind of put myself in the shoes of a 12 or 13 year old young man who uh, his whole life is in the Philippines. 
Mm-hmm. Um, his his whole life is unique uh, and different from a lot of the other kids. Uh, but it sounds like it's just a beautiful, like loving, familial relationship that your mom has created. Was there these levels of excitement about following this American dream um, or trepidation about what may come of a relationship that's blossoming and becoming stronger? Yeah, um, you know, definitely growing up in the poor in the Philippines and seeing movies um, of what the America is like, it, you know, it, we were very excited for it. And, but it's not like my mom married my dad, you know, just to get into the, to the U.S., but because she really loved him. Um, but yeah, we were very just mesmerized about the idea of going here and just living a better life. Um, cause yeah, it, it was very, very tough in the Philippines. Um, but we, we were definitely very excited. How long, uh, did your mom and, and your stepdad date before things started getting serious and, and were there opportunities for where your family or your mom to, to, meet in the United States or visit in the United States prior to marriage? So my dad came once to the Philippines um, and that's actually when they got married there. Uh, um, so we, he, he came there and he was able to just kind of look into our culture um, and see what life is like there. And um, you know, he was riding tricycles and the jeepneys, and he wasn't very really expecting all of that, um, just riding it out in the open. Um, but my dad, uh, we loved him from the very moment that we met him. He was very comforting and very much a father figure. All the things that you had wanted and desperately hoped for yes. your whole life. Yes. How long... Um, had did did your mom and dad live together or uh after their marriage that the discussion about moving to the united states take place uh so my dad was probably in the philippines for maybe a month i would say if i remember um and you know as soon as they got married it was very much an, a topic that um, he wanted us to bring here. So he was able to work, um, get the paperwork done. Um, but also at that time, my sister was applying, my oldest sister was applying to, um, BYU, Idaho. Um, but that, because she was applying to BYU, Idaho, she wasn't, um, approved to come to the U S, um, because our f- family is also migrating because they're thinking that maybe S- Sarah is going to be away Idaho and then just staying in the U S to be with her family. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes, that makes sense. Um, just a curious question about the actual marriage. I wanted to ask this and forgot, were they married in the temple? Was it a civil marriage? It was a, it was a civil marriage. Um, uh I think there might be it might be like an LDS um sp- sponsored church but it was outside the temple. And coming to Utah, I would I'm super curious about the culture shock. Um you eventually are approved, your family is approved to uh immigrate into the United States. And I would just love to understand what that experience is like. The, um, what your expectations were. Maybe we start there. What did you expect Utah and the United States to be? I, I, start, I honestly didn't have any expectation of what Utah is going to be like. I just know that, you know, what you see in the movies, the U.S., like all these tall buildings, metropolitan areas, um, that sounded very fascinating to me. Um, so we flew into Portland. That was our um, destination port. And then we flew into Salt Lake City. And my aunt was there to um, also 
to just kind of welcome us to Salt Lake City. And I just remember being mesmerized and, you know, I'm, I'm going to live here. Um, I'm going to live here in this city. Um, you know, just be, just, I'm just very culture shocked, you know, like our very first restaurant we went to was Chakarama, which was buffet. And we don't have that in Philippines. It probably would be very hard to have it in Philippines because people would just eat everything. Um, but it was awesome to see multiple varieties of food and drinks. And then also just going to a Sonic drive through I didn't know you can go through a drive through and just park your car there and order food um, while you're sailing your car. Has, it, I'm just thinking like all of these things that means nothing to me. Like I, I just think of the, the idea of, I mean, how many times have I driven to Sonic and not even thought about the reality of, of the whole experience? Yeah. This had to have just, just been just inundated with so much new information and, and so many new things. It was. Was it emotionally draining? Was it exhausting to have those experiences? I don't think it was exhausting, but it was, I was very much um, just very open and very much, um, I wanted to see more. Um, like we would go to Temple Square and visit um, the, all the different um, buildings. Um, so yeah, I would say my very first months in the U.S., I was very much an explorer. The reality of moving to the U.S., the tall buildings, the, uh, the art, the culture, um, were all these hopes and, and dreams <laughs> that you had as a young Filipino kid. Um, what was the reality? Uh, where did you end up moving when you got to Utah? And, and were those... Were those uh, expectations met? Uh, certainly not. Like I remember the the ride home, um, you know, after our our few getaways in Salt Lake City. Um, you know, we were just driving. It was a very long drive. It was probably like an hour drive, and we were getting into like more of like a farm area where there's cows everywhere. Um, and I'm just like, are we? are we sure this is the right place? Um, you know, in the Philippines, I grew up in the city too. So it was, it was very much a culture shock. And so when we got to my dad's house and he had like this very big farm behind him, um, it was very different to me. And it was, you know, it was definitely something that I need to tackle on. With the new move, not only do we have a, a cultural shock, uh, a whole new culture to live in and, and experience. But you also now need to meld or migrate into a new school system and a new faith tradition in a very real way. Yes. Because we know that Mormonism in the Philippines isn't the same Mormonism that exists in Utah. Yes. I, I'd love for you to share your experiences both in school and academics and also religiously. What uh, was different and, and what experiences you had? Yeah, so um, I moved to Tree Mountain or to Elwood, um, and I would say it's probably at least eighty percent white people. Um, I think not even one percent Asian. So I was very much in the minority there, and also just to be gay, um, where that is not really accepted there, um, was very challenging for me. It was probably the toughest years. Um, of my life. Um, in school, I always still strive to be a, a good ac academic student, um, but I never grew up having friends, like true friends in high school. I do remember people approaching me and saying hi to me, but I feel like I was put into this shell. Um, because I was so different. And I feel like I, um, like I just wanted to be in this shell. And 
and that was very hard for me because in the Philippines, I was a very um, proud, proud person. Um, but coming, coming here, I just feel like um, I lost myself. Do you attribute a lot of that, uh, a lot of that pain, and a, and a lot of the negative experiences that you had um, to the Latter Day Saint culture? To because I, th- I, I believe for the audience, um, you said you moved to Tremont. Tremont is located in the northern uh, part of Utah, near the Idaho border. Um, Industry-wise, uh, the the main economic uh, factors in that community is farming, farming and ranching. Um, so, I get everything you're talking about here, Josh. I get the the cultural issues, um, the fact that the only person of color, um, or very few people of color in your school, is probably your family and others in a, in a much more distant area or um, laborers. Uh, that is the extent of culture in some of these very small towns. Um, and, and that is a problem for Utah, that there just isn't an, an extensive culture here. So it, I, I get that. And, and also, um, just church-wise, I didn't want to cut you off. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say, um, like even moving here and just adjusting to the culture, um, my dad was... Um, he wanted us to live an American life. Um, in the Philippines, you know, we would eat with our spoon and fork. That's how we eat. But here, you eat with your fork. To and to me, that just was very hard because it's hard to get rice with, and we eat a lot of rice, so it's hard to get eat rice with fork. So um, that was something that he he tried to change about me. Um, No, I love my dad, but, you know, he said, you know, this is, you know, like, this is America. Like, you should be living our culture, kind of like, something like that. Um, But I know it was very hard for me. Did did your dad have other children um, from a previous relationship? Uh, he did. Um, he he. I think he was married twice before, and then he also had. Um, um, and then on his second marriage, he had four children. Um, yeah, but they're they're all. Um, um, they all grew up um, like in a white culture. Yeah. What was your your relationship like with your uh, step siblings? I did not have a relationship with them because um, uh, they were divorced, so we, um, I never met them. You alluded to um, this expectation of culture and this expectation of living the American dream. Um, and, and you're in America now, that statement that you said from your dad. Um, what did that mean? Did, did, was there some connotation there? Was there some... Uh, was this a passive aggressive way uh, of your dad saying, um, leave your feminine, femininity in the Philippines and grow up and be a man yes. in the West? Um, I would say definitely because um, I think my dad also knew that I was gay very um, as soon as he, um, he met me in the Philippines. Um, but I remember when I came. I moved to the U.S. and I went to my room, which was in the basement. And I wondered why, you know, why, why am I in the basement? There's also two other rooms upstairs. Why um, only one of my sisters is going to use the other room. The other one is a vacant room. Why am I being in the basement? So I feel like that was part of his way to maybe man me up and not be scared. Um, and then also going into my room, I saw he put there some baseball gloves and um, a, a baseball. 
Um, so I think he definitely wanted me to um, live a more masculine life. Uh, did it work? Were, did you just miraculously change uh, this beautiful aspect and part of who you were? It did not. I remember I, I, I gave it an effort. Um, you know, I tried to play baseball with him, but I just was never good at it. I tried to play baseball with my neighbors, but um, I'm just not a someone who can catch a ball. Um, I think the one thing that I only um, adapted to here was just um, like gardening and mowing a lawn. We didn't have it in the Philippines, so um, that was one thing that he taught me and he raised me and I actually enjoyed it. Um, and it taught me a lot of good things. Um, but yeah, like even for in high school, I was never a, um, a, a very sporty guy. Like even when we have PE, um, I hated playing dodgeball. Um, I hated um, going into the locker room to change because um, I don't want people to see me in my colorful underwear. Um, so I kind of like always try to change like in the corner or um, always change last. Um, yeah. Growing um up and having these experiences in northern Utah uh, in these farming communities brings with it um, a second part of this discussion and that is the religious culture. Uh, northern Utah specifically, uh, that area, Brigham City, Logan, um, very, very Latter-day Saint, very traditional. Uh, I would love to understand what your experience was like uh, as a gay Asian in um, Mormonism in that part of the state? I will say I lived a fake life. I strive to do, strive to do everything um, that they, I tried to live a life that they wanted for me. Um, but um, yeah, I just like always put a, a, like a smile on my face and just, um, try to do everything I can to be a good deacon, be a good teacher, go through every young man's activities. Um, but I knew that um, deep down inside that, you know, it, that I, I don't really fit in. There is a history within Mormonism and we could spend um, a completely different uh, podcast episode on the issues with race uh, and, and uh, racial problems within Mormonism, but specific to the Book of Mormon and specific to the area uh, from which uh, you came, there is this distinction between two types of people uh, in Mormonism and its culture, and that of the Lamanites and the Nephites. Uh, the Nephites being a group of people who were fair-skinned, white, uh, and desirous and blessed by God and the culture of the Lamanites, uh, the wicked, those who were uh, unfavored by God, uh, who were uh, sinning, who were evil, were warious and mean. Did you experience these levels of racism uh, in your church experience? Um, and was that, and, and how did, how do you mat like manage or mitigate those types of situations? Um, honestly, um, I don't think I've, in the church, I've, I don't think I've experienced racism in the church, um, uh, fortunately. Um, they've always been accepting of our Filipino family. Um, what's helpful is we have a neighbor who also served in the Philippines. So he did a Philippine mission, um, and he was able to just help us get adjusted to the church. Um, and, you know, I thank his, his family for that. Um, and, you know, we were very close with them. Um, and I think there's also another Japanese um, family in, in our ward. Um, 
but as far as um, racism in church, I I don't yeah I don't. They've always been very um, accepting of our race. Did you um, with specific to your church leaders? Because uh, typical in Mormonism, as we've discussed many times in this podcast, is the expectation that uh, when a twelve year old turns twelve, he receives the priesthood, and then he he kind of graduates these different levels of of priesthood service. Uh, in Mormonism, um, it's called the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, and within those priesthoods are different uh, opportunities for service. A deacon uh, is a 12-year-old priesthood holder, a teacher is a 14-year-old priesthood holder, and a priest is a 16-year-old priesthood holder. After the graduation of those uh, kind of three steps of, of uh, priesthood service, then comes this big discussion about uh, serving a mission and an obligation to serve a mission uh, to represent the church and to wear the name tag that bears Jesus Christ's name. You didn't serve a mission, uh, did which means that you you didn't follow that cultural expectation. I'm curious uh, about your discussions um, about your sexuality with your church leaders. Were they, um, did you have them? And were those discussions part of a reason why you didn't serve a mission? So... Um, I've growing up in the Philippines, you know, I've always said I wanted to be a missionary. Um, cause when I've, when our, the missionaries would come to our house, they're always so inviting. So very, um, warm, um, um, and we enjoy their company and i I was preparing myself to become a missionary. Um, and I've always been posting on Facebook, some of the teachings that I've learned from the gospel. And I know um, that my aunt, um, who introduced us to the church, she would often comment saying, I'm going to be a good missionary. Um, you're going to be, um, uh, at the next, you know, missionary in, in the Castro family. Um, but I, I knew that still deep down inside that my, me being gay, um, that I would struggle in my mission, if in, in a mission, if I were to, to do one. Um, I never discussed my sexuality with um, my church leaders. Um, and I don't think I really plan to do it because I don't really want to subject myself in a room where I will be judged for being me. And I think that's just, um, that's like the choice that I choose. If you didn't choose uh, to serve a mission and, and you did that to, maybe I, I mean, I feel maybe that there was a, uh, this choice also was a way to protect you from the church, but maybe in a real way to protect the church from you, uh, in, in that aspect as well, by uh, whether that be awkward, whether that be um, inconvenient um, or strange or unorthodox for the church to have a gay missionary um, that just didn't fit those uh, those norms. If if you choose not to serve a mission uh, and then choose uh, not to to kind of pursue that path that is expected, did you decide then to begin dating? Uh, did what what does Josh do with Josh? in these situations? How do you move forward and, and where do you go? Yeah, like definitely in like, even in high school, um, I, I never dated a girl. Um, the only time I went to a, a, like a school dance was for girl's choice and a girl invited me. Um, but even then I knew that, um, it wasn't right, um, but I still went. Um, I never went to prom. Um, I never had the opportunity to ask, you know, who I really want to go to. Um, so yeah, but um, I think after moving to, um, after high school, I moved to the University of Utah um, for my um, college. 
Um, and that's kind of where I started exploring myself more. And I still was trying to go to the university ward in the church just to kind of test it out and see. Um, but uh, I knew that I really wasn't feeling the spirit when I was going to church. So eventually I just stopped going. What did you, uh, what did you plan on majoring in? Um, and what were your expectations for university, for college? Uh, so I, I went um, into accounting. Um, I've always loved numbers. Um, and I think f college is a big thing for me because um, I, I don't think my mom finished her education. So I wanted to be able to be that person to um, finish college. Um, but I also wanted to move to youth at Salt Lake City and kind of explore myself. So that's, um, I was very much excited for college. I want uh, to definitely have this conversation about what this exploration looks like. Um, because I, I kind of get the sense throughout your story that this uh, might be the very first time that you've given yourself an opportunity to date. Uh, the very first time you've given yourself an opportunity to, uh, to borrow Mormon terms, to live the fullest measure of your creation, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to explore this part of you that um, for probably a three to four year period has been really repressed. Mm -hmm. let's, I, let's dive into that. I'm super fascinated. Um, I know that um, my interests are very different because um, I'm very much attracted to um, people older than me. Um, and so, you know, I tried dating apps and, um, my, my very for, first boyfriend, um, it was actually probably in his, his late fifties and, um, I know that, um, that is not very common, especially, you know, it just, you know, being gay, but also trying to love someone who is of a different generation than you is a little hard. Um, and I've also dated other, uh, another guy um, in his mid thirties. Um, but I knew that, you know, that, that um, older was kind of my interest. How does, uh, where do you begin dating? Where do you begin finding those? I mean, the apps weren't there, but um, I, I'm just curious on how you begin that exploration process. Uh, so yeah, so I did, I did the apps and um, that's how I met some of the guys um, and just, try, just trying to, you know, see what my interests are. Um, but yeah, I really can, I, I connected with my very first boyfriend and he was um, in his fifties and um, I, I liked the maturity. Um, I kind of like to, sometimes I like to think myself like I, I think older sometimes. Um, but I know even for that situation, I can't just be out and proud sometimes because um, Even for the LGBT community, that can also be frowned upon. Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about this because we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of stories on the podcast about uh, intergen intergenerational um, relationships. I want to talk, um, I, and I think you've been really awesome about being candid and open. So I'm going to press you a little bit because um, I'm really curious about what you thought the fears were, um, what uh, what what issues. Um, uh, what pre preconceived notions you thought the public might have, or even your family about those types of relationships. So I just kind of want, want to contrast those um, preconceived issues, uh, perceived issues that you thought existed um, with the actual real lived experiences of, of you dating um, older men. 
I'm just curious about how that unfolded for you. Yeah, so I, I, I definitely had a lot of talk with my mom. And, you know, when she was talking to me, she, she maybe said, um, you know, I kind of, I'm, I understand maybe because you didn't have a father growing up. So maybe you're attracted to older people um, because you're kind of looking for a father figure or something like that. Um, and I don't really feel that way um, because I just, uh, to me, I'm just really attracted to maturity. Um, and then just, you know, also just the physicalities and the looks. Um, Sorry, what was the question again? I, I, uh, I really just want to contrast those, uh, what you think society uh, has okay, against yeah, yeah. Um, this type of relationship as opposed to what the reality was for you. Yeah, so definitely like my mom was very concerned if an older person is just using me um, or if I'm using them, if I'm being in, in it for the money or, um, you know, for not the right reasons. And um, I understand that, um, you know, those concerns, but um, it's definitely very hard to explain. Sure it is. And, and it's hard to explain and it's, it's not something that we get often. And so the other part of this that I was thinking about as you were sharing your story and over the years that I've gotten to know uh, you and your husband is um, the old church message. And your, your husband talked about this in his episode that um, the reasons why people are gay are because the things that you just talked about. The fact that there was no prominent father figure in your life, that there was, Josh, you should really look at this analytically. The reason why you're gay is because you had a, a missing father. Now you can't just replace that with this experience. These are just all things that um, culture and society have brought into this discussion yeah. that I think are wholly unfair. Yeah. It, and and they're, they're not backed by anything other than someone who has not had these experiences trying to explain what our experiences are like. Yeah, and I don't think like um, having a stepdad fixed me. I don't think having a father figure fixed um, changed my changed me. To me, it just even more solidified what I am. You you are who you are, and I think that's part of uh, the message that I try to get across with this podcast is that um, not only are you not broken, but you are not alone in your experiences as well. That uh, there are beautiful opportunities ahead for you if you live and move forward to uh, finding those things that sustain and satisfy you. Yeah, definitely. And then, you know, just also, um, never mind, sorry, keep going. Oh, you're good. We're going to bring your husband in uh, on this next episode. And I, so again, for those who are maybe joined us mid-interview, this is a three-part interview, interview uh, series. Uh, your husband, Richard, uh, had an interview prior to this one. Um, we're understanding a little bit more of your story. And then we're going to bring the two of you together in, in an episode to be able to share um, and dive into these subjects a little more. Because I would imagine... Um, and I say this because I already know the answer, but your husband had um, some similar, some issues actually with uh, dating, this intergenerational dating experience. And the way this unfolds, I think is beautiful. And it, it, it really changed me in a very real way. So I wanna talk a little bit, a little bit about that. But how, how your relationship unfolds, and, and this next episode will absolutely be about love, and it'll be about connection and your wedding and the way forward and, and combining both uh, your experiences and his experiences into a whole new experience and an, a whole new opportunity for you as a couple to grow. But before we get to that third part of, of the episode, I just wanna give you an opportunity to now follow through and 
is there something that we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about? Is there something that you want uh, the audience members to specifically know about your story or maybe a goal that you had um, as part of your episode that you wanted the listeners to understand? Yeah, so I think uh, for me, um, you know, growing up in a Catholic, uh, um, Catholic and then being a convert, um, and then also just having the, um, the pressures from family, um, I was, I had to change myself. Um, I had to hide away who I really am. And, um, sometimes I feel like I'm a disappointment even to my family because, you know, I'm the only son in, in our family and I, in, I don't, the worry is I don't get to carry our last name to multiple generations. And um, I I really struggled a lot in my younger years to, to be myself. And I think if I could just go back and tell my younger self right now, just, you know, just let him know that you're beautiful just the way you are and you don't have to change yourself for anybody Um, because my life experience has changed me so much that um, I feel like it's hard for me to go back to where I was because I was just put so much into this shell. Um, So that's what I would tell myself is just be who you are. You're beautiful. What do you tell, um, what do you tell your small Northern Utah community, um, a community that you completely did not expect the United States to be? Um, Any advice to that culture in regards to experiences now looking back? Uh, that you've had and and opportunities that you've had to grow uh, as a person. If you had an opportunity just to stand in the, the public square and, and share something with that community, what might that be? I would say um, if you see a kid who is struggling, who feels like they're different, um, and at for, even if at first they would try to push you away because they feel like um, they're just so different. Um, I just want you. I just want you to just keep trying and not stop and um, reach out to them because they deserve love and they deserve to be respected for who they are. Lastly, I, I think uh, I see you as a beautiful success, as um, this, this person of incredible um, strength and, and Im- immense love and pureness. I wonder what your advice would be to other Filipino kids who are in a situation different than you, who are still in the Philippines, in a culture and a society that doesn't uh, afford it's queer members, the opportunities that you have. Uh, what might you tell them? Uh, just keep being you. Um, mahalin mo ang sarili mo. Ikaw yan. Um, mahalin mo ang pamilya mo. Uh, You said that with a lot of emotion. Because I wish somebody said that to me. (laughs) Josh, thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful episode. You make me cry. (laughs) 
I often say my cold hard heart can't be broken. Thank you. Thank you. How are we supposed to do no, another episode if you're going to leave us like this? A crying mess. We want to thank you, um, the Latter-day Stories audience, for the opportunity that you've given us to uh, hear Josh's story. And if you uh, haven't yet, we invite you to uh, catch Richard's story uh, posted prior to this one. And now um, we will be able to uh, share with you the couple's version, which will be the, the next uh, podcast episode coming up after uh, this one. Thank you. Thank you for um, leaning into these experiences for better understanding, for your, for your comments, for your uh, ability to draw closer uh, to people like uh, Josh um, and to better understand uh, a more broad, um, I don't even want to say that, just a, a more detailed uh, look at, at what some people have to go through in order to find authenticity and honesty in their life. So thank you. Thank you for being kind and, and for a better understanding these experiences. Uh, again, for those of you who are watching on a video version of our podcast episodes, we invite you to share your comments below. Uh, any, any particular experiences, thoughts that you had during this episode? We'd love to hear them. We'd love for you to participate in the, the comment section uh, of our Facebook and YouTube pages to be able to uh, share those experiences with others who are following along. And again, for those who are listening to this uh, as a podcast episode on one of our podcast players, we invite you to uh, comment about this episode and others that we have posted and also to subscribe to this channel so that you will uh, be, have an opportunity to, to receive additional episodes and, and interviews like this. Again, thank you. Thank you to Josh uh, for sharing his story. Thank you uh, to the audience members for, for, uh, for giving the, your time and energy uh, and participation in, in episodes like this. It's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and it's stories like Josh's that help us each continue writing our own Latter-day stories.